another proud moment in uh, Jamestown Jammers history. Uh, we're, we're glad to continue uh, a good positive relationship with the Florida Marlins and uh, we got some big changes coming for the 2006 season and to start that off we're going to introduce uh, Bo Porter um, with the Marlins as the Jamestown Jammers new manager. Bo, come on, I'd like to present your hat and your jersey. <laughs> Thanks a lot, man. You're welcome. Thank you. Wow. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you to Matt and his whole staff. They've been very, very nice in this whole process. Um, from the time I got the call from Bryant that um, that the Marlins wanted me to come and, and manage the team here, with this being our fifth year, I think you know that the relationship is is continuing to grow. Um, I think it's a good situation for for the Marlins. You know, having our young guys come to a place where you know, they can really, really concentrate on baseball. I think this is a, a, a town that's rich in baseball. Baseball has been here for a long time. Um, I'm excited about it. I know the Florida Marlins are excited. And I think that um, I think that the players that we're going to get here are going to see that, you know, this is this is a really, a really neat town for, for, a, for a minor league player to, to come and play his first year. Or you may have some second year guys that come here also. But a good, a good place to start your um, professional baseball career. So I mean, I'm excited about it. I know you know the Germans are excited, and I think we're gonna we're gonna put put a good product on the field. Okay, right now I'd like to introduce uh, Brian Chan, director of uh, player development for the Florida Marlins, the man who's responsible of getting us our our great draft picks uh, into town. So Brian, thanks, Matty. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks for having me. And thank you all for coming on out and being part of this. I, we had this uh, opening come up in our system for a manager here at Jamestown about a month or so ago. Uh, Mike Mordecai, who was here last year, decided to stay at home. He's coaching a high school team back home. He wants to be with his kids. So we opened up an opportunity here. And um, the decision on who to bring in as your new manager was a very simple one for us. Uh, I've known Bo for a little more than a year now. Uh, he was our hitting coach at Greensboro last year in the South Atlantic League. And uh, it didn't take me long to realize that we have a special baseball talent here in our organization. <clears throat> this guy's um, baseball aptitude, uh, the way he goes about his business, and uh, his passion for this game is unparalleled uh, with many folks that I've seen. He, uh, he has a very distinct way of energizing those he works with and bringing that energy to the field each and every day. I would go to Greensboro last year, probably 20 games to see those guys. It didn't matter what time I got to the park, Bo was already there, working with a player or several players to try to make them better. All the stuff that the fans out there don't see in the development process. And so when, when it came time for us to hire a manager, it was very simple. Bo was the guy I wanted. Bo was the guy the entire staff wanted. And uh, very happy to have him come here be part of uh, Jammers Baseball. Uh, 2006 here, I think, is going to be an exciting year. He's going to bring the passion that he has for this game and the energy level that he brings on a daily basis to this field, to Dietrich Park, and to all the players that put on the Jammer uniform. And I think that's going to show uh, out on the field in our performance. So I'm very happy to have him here. Uh, obviously very happy to continue our relationship here in Jamestown with the Jammers and uh, looking forward to a good uh, 2006. So uh, thank you. Ron, you want to get on the other side? Oh, here's yeah. a picture that's for you guys. Okay. Okay. He's the president of the Jammers Advisory Board. I know Kevin would like to make a Jamestown certainly has a very rich and varied history and tradition of professional baseball. Um, it continues in 2006. Um, I work with a, a group of very dedicated and distinguished volunteers who come uh, meet very frequently to help and advise the Jammers on uh, all various aspects of um, items that relate to professional baseball in town and I would like to uh, thank them uh, for all their volunteer efforts and challenge everyone not just in the Jamestown community but in the surrounding communities to come out in 06 and support and welcome and be a part of this wonderful game of baseball uh, it is America's pastime it's a wonderful facility and on behalf of everyone on the board I would like to welcome Bo Porter in 2006 and we're looking forward to a great year thank you 
Okay, now we'll open up to uh, any questions from, from the media. For in terms of personnel, well, you can address that too if you'd like. Matt, you know, I guess it's a, for all three of you guys, but Brian, why don't you start? Yeah, it's, a, it's a good question and it's an interesting one that I've, I've uh, thought about and, and kind of dealt with quite a bit this off season. In the, in the trades that we made and the, and the changes that we made within our system, we acquired uh, 15 young minor league prospects that are going to uh, filter into our system and uh, hopefully work their way up to the big leagues sooner rather than later. A lot of those players you probably won't see here in Jamestown because they're a little more advanced in age and ability level. Uh, however, when you take into account the large draft that we had last year, uh, acquiring the likes of Chris Volstad and Gabby Sanchez, a couple of difference makers here, uh, we have a what we feel to believe, what we believe is a um, additional amount of talent in our system that we've had. And what you get with that, with the acquisition of these 15 players and the large draft that we've had last year, as well as this year, is you're going to start to see, in my opinion, um, kind of slowing down the system and our talent increasing as well as maybe not quite advancing as fast as they normally would. So in my opinion, uh, we're going to see more talent here in the years to come as a result of the influx that we've had here in the past couple of years. Well, I guess my question to you is how does that make you feel knowing you're going to have some, some guys that um, really are especially talented playing at, uh, at this level where normally if, if they kept their uh, uh, their roster pretty much intact at the major league level, you probably wouldn't have the, the experience and the talent. Well, I think, I think that's good for um, the organization as a whole. I think that um, when you talk about development and you want to develop winners, and I think one of the biggest things as far as developing winners is that they're able to win throughout their minor league career. By the time they get to the big leagues, they know how to win. And the more talent pool, the, the better the talent pool in your organization at each level, the more opportunity that the guys are going to have to develop as winners. So I think that the trades that were made at the major league level and that's being able to bring in the quality of minor league players that we received in those trades are going to make the whole system stronger. And I mean, it will be evident here in Jamestown also. Yeah, my turn. Uh, I kind of want to touch on kind of what both uh, Bo and Brian both had to say regarding one. I'm excited to see that you know the young talent that will be coming to Jamestown, and also with the uh, vacant spots open on the Marlins roster, we kind of see hopefully see some of the guys that been in Jamestown in 2002 and three and four move up, like uh, Jason Vargas. I know he was here you know just a short time and he moved up, and hopefully we can see some of the guys that were here the last couple of years excel through the ranks and see them in the Marlins uniform and you know when they made the major league club. Yeah, what was your reaction to all the transactions here uh, since the end of the season from, from your perspective as a general manager of a Class A team, knowing what impact that will have on the roster here in June? Yeah, it, to me, I was kind of uh, excited about it because it goes back to that point where people can see the Jason Vargas or the Taylor Tangersley or the Eric Reed, the former Jammers of a couple of years ago, see him up in the Major League roster. And I think that's going to, as a selling point, of this, uh, see the stars of tomorrow today, that kind of goes with our whole aspect of here in Jamestown that you can see the young talent that the Marlins provide us and just you know, a few short years later, they're at the major league level. This is a question for uh, Brian. With regards to what's at least circulating around among the major leagues and about the change in the potential scheduling and the timing, uh, which may impact the Penley. Do you have a reaction to this? Uh, you know, something that was going to start potentially this year uh, it looks like something will happen next year. Do you, do you have input at this schedule or at this level where you are at? And do you get a sense where we're going? It, yeah, it's a good question and it was it was one that uh, was brought up this past year. Uh, we have farm director meetings every year and, and it was addressed heavily in those meetings uh, with and it was met with a uh, substantial amount of concern simply because of the lack of time that we as major league organizations would have to uh, make those adjustments. So it was tabled for 06 and it's going to uh, be pursued again in 07. And basically what that's going to mean uh, for the Jamestown Jammers will be an increased uh, length of the season uh, running basically from I guess it would be mid to end of May uh, through about um, the middle of August will be about how that schedule would run. It will increase the length of the season uh, obviously, the more games you play, the happier I am. That's additional development time for our players. Uh, but it also impacts other clubs that we have in our system. Uh, those below us, the Gulf Coast League Marlins, 
extended spring guys. And so those are some things that I have to deal with and um, address to make sure that what we're not getting away from is the development process, because that's the most important thing. I like the system the way it is now. Uh, sometimes change is met with some resistance just because you don't know what's going to happen. And uh, I'm sure MLB tries to have our best interests in mind, but uh, it's just something we're going to have to work through. Will this also <coughs> impact the talent pool because of the fact you have to put together a team here in Jamestown, for example, in May rather than after the draft, which normally occurred uh, in, in uh, late June? Yeah, it's going to be an interesting uh, dynamic. I think what you're going to see are a lot of repeat guys, fellows that you probably saw the year before. You're probably going to see again to start the season in May. And then as the draft comes, which is also going to be changed, it's going to be moved back to the end of June. Whenever that comes, you're going to start to see then a filtering out of the players that we've had here for the first part of the season with some of these newly drafted players. It's kind of how I see it working. So I think you'll see a lot of new faces, a lot of different faces, and a lot more uh, turnover than you've seen in previous years. The ball part of this is your first uh, managing opportunity. You had a chance to manage with some of the greats. See, is there a role model for you? Well, I think that um, throughout my throughout my career, I've taken bits and pieces from a lot of the managers in which I've been privileged to be around. Um, Jim Riggleman, Bobby Cox, Art Howe, and you know, for the for the most part, I think my playing career, because when I played the game, I never played the game just as a center fielder. I played the game within the game, and I pretty much played all nine positions, even even when I was sitting on the bench. So being a manager is almost like an extension of me just taking what I did when I played, and now I'm just going to lead the, whole, the entire team with, with that same mindset. And to Matt, what do you think of George Sisson? So, he's all right. <laughs> No, Jervis is a great guy, and I, I will I'm actually honor asses truthfully. Uh, George has been a big oh, asset. Oh. George has been a big asset to to the organization. I know, especially with this weekend, with all our uh, different events, with the youth clinics and the hot stove dinner, uh, George has really stepped up. And I'm just glad to have George on the staff. Brian, I have a question for you. Uh, uh, thanks to a, a guy who works with you, um, who's from the area originally, Greg Leonard. Um, just talk about him um, and his role in, in the Marlins operation and, and obviously deal with him daily. I would say. Yeah, his, his, his office is about 10 feet from mine. And I wish that we had a few more Greg Letters in our office. He's a, a, a special kind of a guy and, and a real good talent. He's our assistant scouting director, but he really does a whole lot more than just that role. He's, he's, been, with the, well, he's been with the Expos and now the Marlins for probably 12 years. Uh, he's worked his way up. and. And he's about the most efficient worker that I think I've ever seen. He can do more in a day's time. It's like he's in the Army. He can do more before 9 a.m. than most of us do all day. It's impressive to watch him work. And uh, he always speaks quite fondly of the Jamestown area and of uh, him being part of this. And he's, he's obviously happy that we've got an affiliate here. And uh, so he always, I always joke with him every year before we, we start the Jamestown season, we'll get an email, myself, all the player development staff who are going to be in Jamestown from him about all the things to do and see in this neck of the woods. And I unfortunately haven't had a chance to, to take up take him up on some of that stuff. But but uh, Greg's a, a real good asset to the organization and, and a real good baseball man. After the news conference, we had a chance to interview the 2006 Jamestown Jammers manager, Bo Porter, an individual who at age 33 had a career which spanned a time with the Chicago Cubs, the Oakland Athletics, and the Texas Rangers. He had opportunities to work with some of the big names that appear in baseball today, such as Alex Rodriguez, Rafael Palmero. He had chances to meet the Ernie Banks of the world, so he's had an extraordinary opportunity. Here we catch him reviewing the article by Jim Riggs that appeared in the Saturday paper prior to the hot stove and it dealt with a little bit of his days as an Iowa basketball player. Does that article sound like you? Mm-hmm. In fact, when I was reading the article, it, it struck me. Uh, how, does, how does a kid from Newark, New Jersey find his way out to become an Iowa Jayhawk? 
Iowa Hawkeye. Hawkeye, excuse me. Excuse me. How does that happen? Well, I, you know, um, Coach Fry and um, Coach Viducci, Frank Viducci, his, um, Frank Viducci's um, dad was um, the athletic director at Seton Hall Prep, which is um, a school in West Orange, New Jersey. And um, Coach Fry and Coach Elliott, they always had, you know, long ties with um, a lot of the, um, the Newark schools. And then my high school football coach was also one of the coaches at Barringer High School when Andre Tippett went to University of Iowa. So, I mean, the connection was already there, and they, they you know, stay in close relations. So by my junior year is when, you know, Coach Fry and Coach Elliott and Coach Reducci, they started talking to Coach Grove, who was my high school coach, in reference to trying to get me to come to the University of Iowa. Did you, did you, uh, my wife came from Westfield, New Jersey, uh, which is just south of the this, this city, this mm -hmm. Westfield. Newark, did, you, did your paths kind of cross at all? Mm -hmm. High school? Westfield, Westfield is, um, uh, I know you can get there off of 22 or 78. Right. Um, and Westfield, I think Westfield High School is actually in, um, that's Union County. Right. But um, I never played West, I never played Westfield, but um, I know that um, there's some good teams that come out of Westfield, right. football, and, football and baseball. Obviously, you, you excelled in both sports football and baseball uh, and, and, and from the article it sounded like that was something that was important when you went to Iowa that you could do both oh that was that was by far one of the um, sticking points to my recruiting um, and coach Fry and coach Elliott when they came for the home visit they made that you know perfectly clear to myself to my football coach to my baseball coach and um, to my mom that I was going to be allowed to play both sports and at the time Danon Hughes and Jason Olenzak, two guys who were playing football, were also playing baseball. So, I mean, they kind of had the examples of guys that were there, you know, at the university doing it at the time. And one of the sticking points that, that Iowa allowed me, you know, I didn't have to go through fall practice for baseball. I didn't have to do spring, spring football. So it allowed me to just concentrate on football during football season, concentrate on baseball during baseball season such a tough switch though I mean the transition from one to the other was that hard well I think because I was making that transition my whole life right. and I mean in high school I played all three sports I played football basketball and baseball right. and then our basketball team I mean we were we were blessed to be very you know very good you know all the years that I was there we went to the state we went to the state championship twice so we were always playing basketball well into March so, I mean, I was, you know, once baseball season started, I would, you know, go hit in the cage or go throw, do my throwing program, and head down to basketball practice, or we may have a basketball game that night at 7 o'clock. So after school, I'm practicing baseball, and then 7 o'clock that night, I go play my basketball game until basketball season was over with. So, I mean, I was, I was used to making those transitions from football season to basketball season, basketball season to baseball season. Football, you play defensive back. Yes. And baseball outfield? Outfield. Did you find that, that there are skill sets for both of them uh, that, that sort of overlap? Um, definitely. I think um, as far as playing center field, it's almost it's, it's, you use the similar skills that you use playing safety, you know, breaking on the ball, um, you know, reading, reading the ball off the bat. It's like reading the quarterback eyes. Um, so a lot of the skill sets, you know, when you do, when you break on the ball, interception, you want to close hard. Um, same thing in baseball, you break on the ball, you get a beat on it, you want to close hard. So I think the same skill sets that you use playing defensive back for me, I mean, for me playing safety, you use those same skill sets playing center field. You had great success in, in both the college, uh, Coach Fry, I mean, you went to various bowl games, the Rose Bowl, and it just. What was the highlight of your collegiate days? Was it the, the baseball side or was it the football side? Um, I think if you, from a, a highlight standpoint, I think that football, college football, I mean, I think it's just, I mean, outstanding. I mean, I love, I love the bowl games. I love, you know, you look at, look at the bowl game this year with USC and Texas. I mean, that, that there has the intensity of a Super Bowl. So I would say that from a highlight standpoint, I think that the football provided more highlights because you're just playing in front of larger crowds. 
I mean, I remember when we played in Michigan in front of 105,000 people, played at the Rose Bowl in front of over 100,000 people. Um, you know, you, and, and at Iowa, Kinnick Stadium, I mean, it sold out every, every weekend, 85,000, 90,000 90, people. So, and then you go to baseball, and I mean, you may get 4,000, 5,000 people. So from, a, from a, um, a highlight standpoint, I think that the football, you know, there's definitely more of a buzz with, football, with college football than it would be, say, college baseball in Iowa. But um, both programs, I mean, we, we had some outstanding teams. I played with some good guys. And, I mean, Coach Banks, he ran a great program in baseball. And, you know, I mean, Coach Fry, the football program pretty much speaks for itself at Iowa. Sure. At some point, do you have to decide come senior year which which area you're going? You can't do both professionally. Yeah, and, and I, I mean, leaving high school, I think that I knew that that, that day was going to come. But leaving high school, I wasn't ready to make that decision. And I was blessed enough that um, my first, you know, two summers in Iowa, I took classes, anticipating that I'll get drafted, you know, in my junior year. Um, so it kind of put me in position. A unique position that the spring of my senior year, I had already I had enough hours to where I was only six hours from graduation. So it forged me the opportunity when I signed with the Cubs to go to spring training and participate in spring training, get assigned to a team that summer, and then when football practice started, August the fifth, I mean I left the baseball team and went to football practice and finished my senior year of football. And and because I only needed two classes to graduate. You know, registered, took my two classes, and graduated in December. So I mean, it was it was it was a plan that was you know mapped out early on in my Iowa career by the student athletic services, and you know them understanding that okay, this is a multi-sport guy. You know, he's gonna he's gonna play football, he's gonna play baseball, he's probably gonna be drafted in baseball after his junior year. We want to try to put him in a position where he's gonna be in a position to earn his degree. Day one, you walk into spring training with the Chicago Cubs. Uh, what's your reaction? And you literally have your duffel bag, and, and you walk in, and there's the Major League Baseball players that you'd uh, written of, or read about. It's you know, it's it's somewhat of a dream come true. You know, you 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 start out as a as a child, you know, playing you know pickup games on the on on the block with with your with your friends and your buddies and. You know, I was fortunate and blessed that, you know, I got to see the, I went to see the Yankees and the Mets play quite a bit when I was a kid. And so I had always had the dreams of, you know, being, you know, a professional baseball player. And I, I remember the first day, the first, the first day of spring training and I walk up and I see my jersey hanging, hanging in the locker and I sit down and it's almost like I just took like a moment of silence. and. You know, you feel like, okay, wow, you know, I've, I've accomplished this feat that I set out to accomplish a long time ago. It's a, it's a good feeling. Early on, did you have a chance to uh, uh, intersperse with any of the former major leaguers who the Cubs had? Like during spring training, normally they bring back a lot of the uh, Ernie Banks and our out of your, did, mm -hmm. did your paths cross with them? Yes, had a, ch had, a ch had a chance to meet Ernie Banks in my rookie year and we actually we actually stood behind stood behind a cage doing a batting practice group and we were just we were talking about hitting and he gave me a few pointers and I mean Ernie Banks is I mean Mr. Cub a great guy. Sure, sure. What you what, your, what was your reaction to the Cubs organization? You were, you kind of that was your uh, you stayed with the Cubs for some time, didn't you? Mm-hmm. I mean I was you know I was drafted by the Cubs and was in the Cubs system. Um, from 94 all the way to, ni to the end of the 99 season. And, you know, it was, it, was, it was one of those things where I think it was the transition period for the Cubs from a front office standpoint and, you know, a team standpoint. And um, from my understanding, when, when they decided to take me off the roster, I think it was more of a, um, just a numbers thing. It wasn't, I mean, the organization, when you talk to Ed Lynch and, and Jim Hendry, and I mean, I've, I've, I've talked to a lot of those guys, you know, since, since I left the Cubs organization. And I mean, there's nothing but, nothing but love, you know, from, from, both, from both ends. And I understood it, you know, that they were trying to protect some other guys that they may have had, you know, more money invested in. And the Oakland A's, I mean, saw that as an opportunity. Um, I think their scouts, 
you know, had, had seen me play because, I mean, we, they're, they're in Arizona spring training with us, so we played them quite a bit in spring training. And um, then we also played them quite a bit in AAA that year, um, their um, Vancouver team. So when the opportunity came about, I mean, they took me in a major league, you know, portion of the Rule 5, and, and that's how I ended up going from the Chicago Cubs to the Open A's. During that year, there is a playoff game. Mm -hmm. And you have a chance to get into the game. Mm -hmm. And what was that feeling like, and what was the result? Um, I think we were playing the Yankees. And um, it, was, it, was, it was actually, you know, pretty, pretty neat for me. I mean, you know, being a, a Jersey boy and going back to, to New York and having my, you know, my high school coach and a lot of fans and a lot of friends and family, you know, at the game. And growing up in New Jersey where the white Gooden is like, you know, I mean, that's when the Mets, you know, won the World Series in 86. And, and the white Gooden was, you know, probably one of the best pitchers in baseball at the time and one of my childhood heroes. And, I mean, here it is. We're in a postseason game and, you know, I'm about, to, I'm about to step into the batter's box and the white Gooden is pitching his last baseball game. Um, so it was, it was a, lot, a lot of emotion and at the same time it um, was a pretty, a, a moment that I, I'll probably cherish forever. And tell the audience what happened. Um, I got a base hit in the RBI. <laughs> I, think Sha, I think Eric Sha, I think, Sha, I think Chavez was on third, I think. And, um, I think he threw me a slider, and I was kind of out in front, and you know, got a, enough enough barrel to it to hang to to get the ball on the ground, and you know, God gave me good speed, and I was able to beat out a single to first base, and I think Chavez scored and got an RBI single. And so ended your record in postseason play as a batter of 1,000. Yes, <laughs> it did. <laughs> That's pretty. Handy. But I tell you what, I will take the 1,000 back for us to win yeah. the series. What was the feeling like in the clubhouse, you know, you, know, you guys, you had a good year that year? We had a very good year. And, you know, I mean, you always, you, you, you can look at, it, look at all the sports and at the end of the year is one champion and all the other teams for the rest of their lives, they'll look back and they'll try to figure out what went wrong and so forth and so on. And I think that, you know, every, every guy on that team will look back and probably point to one or two different things that you know, that maybe we could have done better or maybe, you know, could have went, you know, the ball could have bounced our way. And it's, it's just one of those things that it just wasn't meant to be, you know. I mean, we, we, had, we had a shot, we had an opportunity. And, I mean, the Yankees, you know, they came from behind and, and, and won the series. After that year was over, did you get a sense that uh, that was only going to be a one-year deal in Oakland for you? Actually, actually, I, I, I didn't. Um, you know, consider, con, con, considering the way the end of the year went and and um, me getting the opportunity to to make the postseason roster and, and contribute down the stretch, I kind of felt like, you know, maybe maybe I'll be a part of the long-term plans, but that wasn't the case. And, and actually, that not being the case gave me probably the best opportunity that I had, you know, in my big league career to go to Texas. And, I mean, that there was a wonderful, wonderful experience. Why was it so wonderful? Um, one, I, you know, Johnny Oates, the late Johnny Oates. I mean, probably one of one of the best managers I've ever had. I mean, he's he's a real players manager, um, a Christian man, which is which is very high high on my chart. And he he was he gave me an opportunity, you know, to play every day. And I mean, I hadn't had that opportunity in my other two stops in the, in the major leagues. And with that, with that, with that opportunity, I think that you know I made the most of it and took advantage of it. And you know, the time that I was able to play regularly, I was able to you know to put up some good numbers. So I mean, I thank him for that and for giving me that opportunity. I thank the Texas Rangers for giving me that opportunity. And and then also, I played with some great guys there. Well, let's I mean, talk about some of them. You could you can drop some pretty good names here. Yes, I mean, I, I played with some great guys there, built some great friendships, and. I mean, from Alex Rodriguez to Pudge Rodriguez to um, the late Ken Caminiti, Rafael Palmero, Andres Galarraga, Randy Velarde, Rusty Greer. I mean, our, our opening day lineup, I mean, you would look at that team and, and, I mean, 
I, arguably, someone would say, I mean, this team here is going to, this team is going to boat race the American League West. But it's that old habit that you have to pitch to win in this right. game. Yeah. And we didn't, we, didn't, we, we didn't pitch well, and consequently, that's why we didn't win a lot of ball games. They sort of cleaned house after that, didn't they? Yes, they did. They, I mean, it was, it was, it was they, they started cleaning house from top to bottom. And, you know, that there, that there moved, me, moved me out, and I ended up signing free agent and um, ended up with the Braves the next two years. And, and that, that there was another good experience, just being around the people that I was, that I was able to be around, the teammates and Bobby Cox and, and Schultz, and just getting to see another organization and how, how they run their organization was, was also, I mean, I was able to learn a lot of positive things, you know, from that group of people. If you had to say, Greg, Greg, the funniest thing that ever happened to Bo Porter in the major leagues, mm. I would answer as follows. Okay. You want me to answer or are you going to answer? No, I'm not going to answer, but go ahead. That's just a question. The funniest thing. Oh, I'm trying to think on that. Can we get a to-be-continue on that to question? To-be-continue, sure. Yeah, okay. Well, let's go the opposite. What's the mm. most embarrassing thing that happened to you? The most embarrassing thing, oh, I can remember this. This is my rookie year. We were playing the Pittsburgh Pirates, and John Lieber is pitching probably the game of his life. He's got a shutout going. Uh, I don't know if he's giving up one hit or two hits, or I don't know. I get a routine fly ball, routine fly ball in left field, and here it is. I mean, I'm coming off a minor league season where I had a 1,000 fielding percentage. I mean, did not make an, an I had, hadn't made an error in like 200 and, I don't know, they, 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 had, they had it in the paper, like 200-something games without an error. And I get a routine fly ball, and I'm camped underneath it, put my glove up, the ball hits. You know, I, I commit the cart new sin that you tell kids, look the ball into your glove. Right. And, you know, I'm there, camp, you know, put my glove up, the ball hits the heel of my glove, falls down. Yeah. The guy gets to second base, I throw the ball, and now, all right, now, to, to at, make that as worth, we were only winning the game two to nothing. So then the next guy gets a base hit. Now the score is two to one, and I'm sitting out there. I'm standing myself. I said, "This game should be over. How in the world did I miss that ball?" So I mean, if I look back out of all the things that happened, that's probably one of the most embarrassing moments of um, of my big league career. We'll get back to the the uh, funniest thing. The uh, Andres Galarraga started here in Jamestown. Mm -hmm. So you were. Literally, when you walk down the, uh, into Dietrich Park, that's where Galarraga, Randy Johnson, and other folks, uh, Marcus Grissom, uh, who's Atlantic, all started here. Mm -hmm. Galarraga, what kind of guy was he? Did you get a sense? Did you get a chance to interface with him much? Yes, I did. I mean, he's 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 a great guy, a good. I mean, just a, a good teammate. He's he's one he's one he's one of the one of the veterans that, I mean, he always would come and talk to the younger guys and. He's just he's he's real soft spoken, but you can tell that you know when he's talking to you and the words that that you know that he's trying to share with you, that is he's really passionate about what it is he's saying. I mean he's he's I mean a great teammate and just I mean a great human being. Did your paths also cross with him in, in Atlanta? No, no, I didn't cross paths with him in Atlanta. Uh, we talked. I asked you earlier, but as far as you taking on this wonderful opportunity as your first managerial job. Uh, and I asked you about you know, role models and, and maybe certain uh, um, strategies or certain characteristics that some of your managers have. Did you, can, can you identify that, like, Bobby Cox gave me this and Riggleman gave me this? Well, I, I think, um, you know, from, from, a standpoint, from a standpoint of Bobby Cox, one, one of the things that, that I realized right away when I got over to the Braves organization is just the um, the amount of focus that goes into the preparation for the season. Um, so I think that's something that I w that I will definitely take you know from my experience with the Atlanta Braves and with Bobby Cox. Um, with Art Hal, Art Hal is you know probably your 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 typical players manager. I mean he's you know he's 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 there for the players. It, it's it's, it's, he likes the the rah rah mojo type of atmosphere where the players are loosey goosey so far and so on, and I think that that's good for certain teams. Um, Jim 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 Riggleman is is real calm in his approach. Um, 
And sometimes the, if you have a veteran team, when I played with the Cubs, we had a real veteran team. So I think that I think that's the position he took because we had a lot of veterans. So I mean, it all depends on you know the personnel and what you have. But like I said, I mean, even some of the minor league managers that I played for, um, Dave Trimley, you know, who is he? I think he's a Triple A manager for the Baltimore Orioles. Um, I, I played for Terry Kennedy, who played in the big leagues for a long time. I mean, he really he really helped my development as far as you know professionalism and you know respecting the game and playing the game hard. So. I mean, I, I look at all the different people that I've that I've been able to come in contact, you know, through through playing a game, and even a lot of the guys that I played with, a lot of the players that I played with, you know, the Mark Graces, the you know, the Alex Rodriguez, the, the you know, the Miguel Tejadas. I mean, all, all of those guys, you know, basically, if you're if you're around baseball people, they're gonna rub off on you, and they're gonna rub off on you from a sense where you're gonna take. The, the knowledge and experiences that you're able to learn from those guys, and you're going to share it with the people that you come in contact with also. What do you think the biggest challenge is going to be for a bow porter in dealing with a 18, 19-year-old kid who's just signed and this is his first professional experience? Well, I think, I think the biggest challenge for any, any manager, whether it's a new manager or a veteran manager, is establishing the respect of your players. And as long as as long as you have the respect of your players and they trust that you're in it for them, because I mean you can't. I'm not in it for me. I'm in it. I'm, I'm in it for. I'm in it for the players. And as long as they know that you're in it for them, they will respect you and they will play hard for you. And that's that. that I think that there is the biggest challenge, whether I'm managing, you know, in a ball or managing in the big leagues, is is having the respect and trust of my players. Have you had a chance to talk to Mike Mordecai about his experience here last year? Um, I didn't get a chance to talk to him about the on the field experience. Um, we talked briefly um, toward the um, right before the uh, winter meetings. We just we just spoke briefly when I found out that I was possibly going to come here. And um, it's interesting that actually I'm supposed to be calling Morty back. So <laughs> <laughs> Morty, I'm going to get back to you <laughs> um, after this trip is over. I'm going to give him a call and, and definitely I'm going to ask ask him some questions. Yeah. Uh, he he chose not to. Just, he wanted to do something different this year. From my understanding, yeah, I think he's going to coach um, high school baseball um, in his hometown, and he wanted to spend more time with his family. Um, I think that's I think that's um, what the decision that he made. This was an interesting story, only because I doubt if there's been anybody who played baseball or who managed uh, at a minor league level and then go up and play some games in the major league in the same year. Yes, that was pretty neat. That was pretty neat. So, who knows, Bo? Maybe he'll be up. Swinging the big bat before this. No, no. I think my plan. I think my plan days are over. I think that um, this here is the avenue in which you know, which I'm, which I will, which I would like to take right now. And I, that was one of the things. That was the reason why I took the whole 2004 season off. I didn't coach. I didn't do anything. I kind of got away from the game because I wanted to get that play inside out of me. Okay. I, I think that you know, if you're if you're trying to manage or coach, and in the back of your mind you still want to play. I don't think you can give you can give the players your all. At some point, somebody called you and said, "Bo, we're going to let you go." And that 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 call from Atlanta, I guess it was, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. that last place. Was that difficult to receive? And they finally said, "Bo, this has been fun, but this is your last." You know, this as far as they're concerned. Mm -hmm. And you had to finally walk in and say, "Maybe this is the last year for me in baseball." as far as active playing baseball. Is that hard? I think, I, I think that, um, it, yeah, yes, the answer your question, yes, it was hard, but at the same time, I think that um, I had started planning for my transition, and I think that the fact that I had, ta I had taken the necessary steps to plan for that transition made it a much easier fall. Um, I think the, the fall part of it was more of not, be, not being able to go out and compete every day, which that's basically what I love to do. But um, if I'm not going to play, this here is the next best thing to plan. Yeah. By the way, you're very articulate. And very, you're very knowledgeable on the, on the subject matter, and which you can commend it. No, thank you. You have great depth of knowledge here. Uh, back to the most, um, most uh, embarrassing thing. Well, you talk about embarrassing, the, the yeah. funniest thing. Funniest thing. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. I'm trying to think, I'm trying to think. 
uh, while you're thinking about it, I'll give you Mike, Mike Mordecai said, Mike, and I asked the same question, he was at bat at Yankee Stadium, uh, was playing for Atlanta, and all of a sudden Morgana, the, the, the stripper, the kissing bandit, mm -hmm. while he's at bat, she came on to the field. And he said, everybody laughed and everybody, I mean, he's trying to be serious, you know, trying to, he was one of those men on second, third, and he's trying to be intense. Mm -hmm. And the whole world is just exploding in laughter all around him. And it drove him nuts because there was this blonde haired, you know, buxom lady mm -hmm. running onto the field and Mike threw them all apart. And he, of course, got up and they finally restored order. He just did a little dribbler. The, the inning was over and he was just, you know, so, embarrassed by the fact that he just couldn't compose, could keep his composure. Well, you know, now that I think about the funny, one of the funniest things, I don't know if this is the most funniest thing, but we were in Anaheim, this is when I was playing with the Rangers, and we had like three road uniforms. So, you know, the clubhouse guy, they pack all your stuff and so forth and so on. And um, so I came over early that day um, to get some extra hitting with um, Rudy, our hitting coach. So we hit early. And then I came back in, I got something to eat, took a shower, and then got dressed for batting practice. So I get dressed for batting practice, and we had, you know, we had the black, we had the black tops, the blue, and then we got the gray, depending upon which one we're going to wear. So I put on, you know, my blue, thinking that, you know, this is BP, we're going to wear our regular BP tops. So everybody else comes out and they have on the black tops. So. We're stretching, and I'm I started, I, start, I started talking, and you know, before you know, I'm talking to Pat Mahomes and talking to Kenny Rogers, and you know, we're stretching. So then, all of a sudden, you know, different guys start talking to me. So now we're stretching, stretching, stretching. We we break up stretch. We start playing catch, and it still haven't dawned on me that I'm the only one with a blue jersey on. <laughs> so everybody is everybody is you know looking over at me. All of a sudden, you know, the camera people start coming down and. They're, they're panning the, you know, panning the line, and so, and actually I'm hitting in group one this day. So they go, group one, okay, everybody up. So then I get up, you know, go, go grab my bat and this and that, and the camera people starts to follow. So now I'm like, okay, now do they think I'm Alex, or <laughs> what is going on? So I get ready to get inside the box, and then the camera people, they're, they're you know, filming and they're looking, so then everybody just start busting out laughing. And I'm like, what is so funny? And it, then I look down and I'm like, oh man. So I'm the only guy out of the, all 25 guys, I'm the only guy out there with the blue jersey. So that's, that, was one, that was one of the, one of the funnier days of my experiences that I could think of. Oh, that's, that's great. What was the most amazing thing you saw on the field? You saw some tremendous talent. You were playing with a tremendous amount of talent. Mm -hmm. you know, in the major leagues, the, the, the number of years you were. It's got to be an incident or two. You said, "My gosh, this is that was unbelievable." Either an offensive play or a defensive play. That um, I I actually think that one of, one of the most it, it's not even something that I saw on the field. It's more because um, the same year I came to Texas, Alex Rodriguez came to Texas, and the year before that, I played against him. You know, I played against him when he was with Seattle and I was with Oakland. And I mean, you've always, you know, played against the guy, and you, you know, wow, you know, this kid can really play. He's good, you know, so far and so on. And um, I remember we, we got to spring training, and the first day of spring training, you know, Alice comes over to me. He's like, "Bo, you know, what are you doing six thirty tomorrow morning?" And I was like, it's "Like nothing." I said, um, "I mean, I'll be heading over to the park soon." He was like, "You want to hit in the cage?" So I was like, "I said, yeah." I mean, here it is. I mean, here's a guy who won a batting title, one of the best hitters in baseball. And I mean, here it is. I'm a guy trying to make the team. I mean, of course I want to hit. So make a long story short, we met in the cage 6.30 every morning. And we would hit for an hour before everybody else got there. And I mean, we just, we would talk. And I mean, we're still best of friends today. We talk. And I said to myself about, two or three days into it, I said, and people wonder why this kid is so good. Mm -hmm. I said, here it is, this kid's one of the best hitters in baseball, and we don't stretch to 9 o'clock. He's at the park, 6.30 in the morning, mm -hmm. working on his swing, and like he said, he said, Bo, this is the best time for me to come work. There's nobody else here. I get to get my work in. He said, batting practice is such of a show, and 
you know, people want to, you know, talk to you and media. He was just like, this is the time where I really just get the focus and put my work in. And that there was just amazing to me. I mean, because I've been on, you know, other teams where, I mean, you have the quote unquote superstar guys that, you know, stretches at nine o'clock, they walk through the door at 830, put their clothes on and, you know, walk out and stretch. Mm -hmm. And here it is. This is arguably one of the best players ever played a game. And the type of the type of work ethic that he, you know, displayed every day was, I mean, it was amazing to me. And that was the same year he got that huge signing bonus, right? I mean, yes, and that, that's, the, you, and, and, and to, add, to add to that, you're talking about the highest paid guy in the game. I mean, he's making $25 million a year um, over the next 10 years. I mean, it's guaranteed. And, you know, that just, sh it showed me that, you know, his passion for the game is, I mean, it's all, I, mean I, I work with kids in Houston, you know, I have a baseball academy, and I explain to them all the time, you have to play this game because you love to play. You can't play for money, you can't play for fame, you can't play for any of those, any of those reasons, because one day, none of, all of those reasons, you may be like Alex Rodriguez, you make $25 million, or Roger Clemens, $20 million a year, where it's not even gonna be a question of, do you have enough money? It's not going to be a question of, do you have enough fame? So when it all comes down to it, if you're not playing for the passion and the love for the game, you're not, you, you, you're not, you, you're not going to be able to keep playing. So, I mean, it just, it just you know, just restored my whole, my, whole, my whole thought process of you have to have passion and desire and love to play this game. And you have all that. Yes, I do. Terrific, and Jamestown's going to be the beneficiary of that this year. Yes, they will. And I mean, I, 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 like I said this morning, I think it's, I think it's a great, a great situation for for the Florida Marlins. I mean, this is a real historic place. Um, you know, when we have we, we have we have some good young talent. Uh, we had a, a great draft class last year. Um, all of the the off season, you know, trades in which we've made have, you know, really strengthened our minor league system, which will affect. The development at all of our levels. So I mean, I'm I'm excited about it. I think the organization is excited, and um, the people in Jamestown should be excited. This has been terrific. Thank you. Thank you.